Perestroika, Russian, Perestroika IPA, PR Strok Listen was a political movement for reformation within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union during the 1980s and 1990s and is widely associated with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and his glasnost meaning openness policy reform. The literal meaning of perestroika is restructuring, referring to the restructuring of the Soviet political and economic system. Perestroika is sometimes argued to be a significant cause of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the revolutions of 1989 in Eastern Europe, and the end of the Cold War. Summary Perestroika allowed more independent actions from various ministries and introduced some market-like reforms. The goal of perestroika, however, was not to end the command economy but rather to make socialism work more efficiently to better meet the needs of Soviet citizens. The process of implementing perestroika arguably exacerbated already existing political, social, and economic tensions within the Soviet Union and is often blamed for furthering the political ascent of nationalism and nationalist political parties in the constituent republics. Perestroika and its associated structural ailments have been cited as major catalysts leading to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Economic reforms In May 1985, Gorbachev gave a speech in Leningrad in which he admitted the slowing of economic development, and inadequate living standards. This was the first time that a Soviet leader had done so. The program was furthered at the 27th Congress of the Communist Party in Gorbachev's report to the Congress, in which he spoke about perestroika, uskoreny, human factor, glasnost, and expansion of the Khosrashiat commercialization. During the initial period 1985 of Mikhail Gorbachev's time in power, he talked about modifying central planning but did not make any truly fundamental changes acceleration. Gorbachev and his team of economic advisors then introduced more fundamental reforms, which became known as perestroika restructuring. At the June 1987 plenary session of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union CPSU, Gorbachev presented his basic theses, which laid the political foundation of economic reform for the remainder of the existence of the Soviet Union. In July 1987, the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union passed the law on state enterprise. The law stipulated that state enterprises were free to determine output levels based on demand from consumers and other enterprises. Enterprises had to fulfill state orders, but they could dispose of the remaining output as they saw fit. However, at the same time the state still held control over the means of production for these enterprises, thus limiting their ability to enact full cost accountability. Enterprises bought input from suppliers at negotiated contract prices. Under the law, enterprises became self-financing, that is, they had to cover expenses wages, taxes, supplies, and debt service through revenues. No longer was the government to rescue unprofitable enterprises that could face bankruptcy. Finally, the law shifted control over the enterprise operations from ministries to elected workers' collectives. Gosplans Russian, Gosudurstvenij Komite po Planoroveniu Gosudurstveni Komite po Planoroveniu State Committee for Planning Responsibilities were to supply general guidelines and national investment priorities, not to formulate detailed production plans. The Law on Cooperatives, enacted in May 1988, was perhaps the most radical of the economic reforms during the early part of the Gorbachev era. For the first time since Vladimir Lenin's new economic policy was abolished in 1928, the law permitted private ownership of businesses in the services, manufacturing, and foreign trade sectors. The law initially imposed high taxes and employment restrictions, but it later revised these to avoid discouraging private sector activity. Under this provision, cooperative restaurants, shops, and manufacturers became part of the Soviet scene. Gorbachev brought perestroika to the Soviet Union's foreign economic sector with measures that Soviet economists considered bold at that time. His program virtually eliminated the monopoly that the Ministry of Foreign Trade had once held on most trade operations. It permitted the ministries of the various industrial and agricultural branches to conduct foreign trade in sectors under their responsibility, rather than having to operate indirectly through the bureaucracy of trade ministry organizations. 
In addition, regional and local organizations and individual state enterprises were permitted to conduct foreign trade. This change was an attempt to redress a major imperfection in the Soviet foreign trade regime, the lack of contact between Soviet end-users and suppliers and their foreign partners. The most significant of Gorbachev's reforms in the foreign economic sector allowed foreigners to invest in the Soviet Union in the form of joint ventures with Soviet ministries, state enterprises, and cooperatives. The original version of the Soviet Joint Venture Law, which went into effect in June 1987, limited foreign shares of a Soviet venture to 49% and required that Soviet citizens occupy the positions of chairman and general manager. After potential Western partners complained, the government revised the regulations to allow majority foreign ownership and control. Under the terms of the joint venture law, the Soviet partner supplied labor, infrastructure, and a potentially large domestic market. The foreign partner supplied capital, technology, entrepreneurial expertise, and in many cases, products and services of world competitive quality. Gorbachev's economic changes did not do much to restart the country's sluggish economy in the late 1980s. The reforms decentralized things to some extent, although price controls remained, as did the ruble's inconvertibility and most government controls over the means of production. By 1990 the government had virtually lost control over economic conditions. Government spending increased sharply as an increasing number of unprofitable enterprises required state support and consumer price subsidies continued. Tax revenues declined because republic and local governments withheld tax revenues from the central government under the growing spirit of regional autonomy. The elimination of central control over production decisions, especially in the consumer goods sector, led to the breakdown in traditional supply-demand relationships without contributing to the formation of new ones. Thus, instead of streamlining the system, Gorbachev's decentralization caused new production bottlenecks. Topic. Comparison with China Perestroika and Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms have similar origins but very different effects on their respective countries' economies. Both efforts occurred in large socialist countries attempting to modernize their economies, but while China's GDP has grown consistently since the late 1980s albeit from a much lower level, national GDP in the USSR and in many of its successor states fell precipitously throughout the 1990s. Gorbachev's reforms were gradualist and maintained many of the macroeconomic aspects of the command economy including price controls, inconvertibility of the ruble, exclusion of private property ownership, and the government monopoly over most means of production. Reform was largely focused on industry and on cooperatives, and a limited role was given to the development of foreign investment and international trade. Factory managers were expected to meet state demands for goods, but to find their own funding. Perestroika reforms went far enough to create new bottlenecks in the Soviet economy but arguably did not go far enough to effectively streamline it. Chinese economic reform was, by contrast, a bottom up attempt at reform, focusing on light industry and agriculture, namely allowing peasants to sell produce grown on private holdings at market prices. Economic reforms were fostered through the development of special economic zones. Designed for export and to attract foreign investment, municipally managed township and village enterprises and a dual pricing system leading to the steady phasing out of state dictated prices. Greater latitude was given to managers of state-owned factories, while capital was made available to them through a reformed banking system and through fiscal policies in contrast to the fiscal anarchy and fall in revenue experienced by the Soviet government during perestroika. Perestroika was expected to lead to results such as market pricing and privately sold produce, but the union dissolved before advanced stages were reached. Another fundamental difference is that where perestroika was accompanied by greater political freedoms under Gorbachev's glasnost policies, Chinese economic reform has been accompanied by continued authoritarian rule and a suppression of political dissidents, most notably at Tiananmen Square. Gorbachev acknowledges this difference but has always maintained that it was unavoidable and that perestroika would have been doomed to defeat and revanchism by the nomenclatura without glasnost, because conditions in the Soviet Union were not identical to those in China. Gorbachev had lived through the era in which the attempted reforms by Khrushchev, limited as they were, were rolled back under Brezhnev and other pro-totalitarian conservatives, and he could clearly see that the same could happen again without glasnost to allow broad oppositional pressure against the nomenclatura. 
Gorbachev cited a line from a 1986 newspaper article that he felt encapsulated this reality. The apparatus broke Khrushchev's neck and the same thing will happen now. Another difference is that Soviet Union faced strong secession threats from its ethnic regions and a primacy challenge by the RSFSR. Gorbachev's extension of regional autonomy removed the suppression from existing ethnic regional tension, while Deng's reforms did not alter the tight grip of the central government on any of their so-called autonomous regions. The Soviet Union's dual nature, part supranational union of republics and part unitary state, played a part in the difficulty of controlling the pace of restructuring, especially once the new Russian Communist Party was formed and posed a challenge to the primacy of the CPSU. Gorbachev described this process as a parade of sovereignties and identified it as the factor that most undermined the gradualism of restructuring and the preservation of the Soviet Union. This caused a situation in the USSR whose closest analogue would be if English sovereignty undermined that of the United Kingdom at a time when the entire UK society and economy was under significant stress and reform, or if North China had a party and state emerge as a challenge to the CCP and PRC during Deng's reforms. <laughs> Perestroika and Glasnost One of the final important measures taken on the continuation of the movement was a report from the Central Committee meeting of the CPSU titled, On Reorganization and the Party's Personnel Policy. This report was in such high demand in Prague and Berlin that many people could not get a copy. One effect was the sudden demand for Russian dictionaries in order to understand the content of Gorbachev's report. The role of the West in perestroika During the 1980s and 1990s the United States President George H. W. Bush pledged solidarity with Gorbachev, but never brought his administration into supporting Gorbachev's reform. In fact, no bailout for Gorbachev was a consistent policy line of the Bush administration, further demonstrating the lack of true support from the West. President Bush had a financial policy to aid perestroika that was shaped by a minimalist approach, foreign policy convictions that set Bush up against other U.S. internal affairs, and a frugal attitude, all influencing his unwillingness to aid Gorbachev. Other factors influenced the West's lack of aid as well like the in-house Gorby skeptics. Advocacy, the expert community's consensus about the undesirability of rushing U.S. aid to Gorbachev, and strong opposition to any bailout at many levels, including foreign policy conservatives, the U.S. Congress, and the American public at large. The West seemed to miss an opportunity to help reform the Soviet regime into a more democracy-like society. The Soviets aided in the expansion of Western capitalism to allow for an inflow of Western investments, but the perestroika managers failed. President Bush had the opportunity to aid the Soviet Union in a chance to improve their government, like Harry S. Truman did for Western Europe. Early on, as perestroika was getting underway, I felt like the West might come along and find it a sensible thing to do—easing Russia's difficult transition from totalitarianism to democracy. What I had in mind in the preface IV first place, was the participation of the West in conversion of defense industries, the modernization of light and food industries, and Russia's inclusion on an equal member footing in the frameworks of the international economic relations. You, and like some Democrats, I did not expect manna from heaven. But counted on the Western statesmen to use their common sense, President George H. Bush continued to dodge helping the Russians and the President of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, laid bare the linkage for the Americans in his address to a joint session of Congress on February 21, 1990. I often hear the question, how can the United States of America help us today? My reply is as paradoxical as the whole of my life has been, you can help us most of all if you help the Soviet Union on its irreversible, but immensely complicated road to democracy. T. He sooner, the more quickly, and the more peacefully the Soviet Union begins to move along the road toward genuine political pluralism, respect for the rights of nations to their own integrity and to a working, that is a market, economy, the better it will be, not just for Czechs and Slovaks, but for the whole world. When the United States needed help with Germany's reunification, Gorbachev proved to be instrumental in bringing solutions to the German problem and Bush acknowledged that Gorbachev was moving the USSR in the right direction. 
Bush, in his own words, even gave praise to Gorbachev to salute the man in acknowledgement of the Soviet leader's role as the architect of perestroika, who had conducted the affairs of the Soviet Union with great restraint as Poland and Czechoslovakia and GDR, and other countries that had achieved their independence, and who was under extraordinary pressure at home, particularly on the economy. Topic see also topic References topic Further reading Baikov v. D. Leningradsky Hironiki at Poslevoni 50 h. Du Liha 90 h. M. Karamzin 2017. 486 s. In English, Leningrad Chronicles, From the Post-War Fifties to the Wild Nineties, Baikoff V.D. ISBN 978-5-00071-516-1 Albuquerque, Cesar. Perestroika in Progress, An Analysis of the Evolution of Gorbachev's Political and Economic Thought 1984-1991, 2015. Master Thesis, University of São Paulo in Portuguese Topic External links Mikhail Gorbachev on Perestroika Chris Harman and Andy Zabrowski. Glasnost, Before the Storm Summer 1988. Yakovlev on Perestroika The Economic Collapse of the Soviet Union Perestroika, TM in Ukraine The Decline of the Soviet Union, A Hypothesis on Industrial Paradigms, Technological Revolutions and the Roots of Perestroika by Angelo Segrillo.